Good afternoon and welcome to day two of the uh, Epilepsy Ireland National Conference. Uh, you might have seen me before. My name is Rick O'Shea. I've been the Epilepsy Ireland National Patron for longer than I care to remember. Uh, and I'm somebody who's had epilepsy myself since I was a kid. Um, I'm here today, though, to talk about somebody else who's not me and to have a conversation with someone who's had a far more interesting both career um, in surrounded fields and to talk about his own experience as well. Jim Morrow. Uh, was a clinical neurologist. He was a visiting consultant neurologist, an honorary clinical lecturer at Queen's University. He's a supervising tutor at the Ulster University. There's a long list here. I'm just cherry picking the best bits and pieces. He was the 50th president of the Irish Neurological Association and the vice president of the, the Irish chapter of the International League Against Epilepsy, which uh, many of you may know. He's the founder and has been the principal investigator of the UK and Ireland Epilepsy and Pregnancy Register. I'm going to talk to him a little bit about that later on, because that that is amongst one of the first organizations to expose the harmful effects of sodium valparate in uh, pregnancy. He appeared in the Panorama special that many of you may have seen. His uh, research interests are uh, well established. He's published over 70 research publications, 50 abstracts. He's spoken at conferences around the world. And now he is a writer of crime fiction novels. Jim Morrow, how are you? And uh, welcome to the conference. I didn't recognize myself there. I'm, I'm very, very embarrassed. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> That, that's what happens when you've achieved that many things, although I tried to trim, trim that list all the way down. Um, tell me, I'm going to start possibly at the very beginning before we even get into to, to your career, um, Jim. Just maybe tell me a little bit about, before you, you get into medicine, a little bit about your own background. Um, my parents were both um, dentists. And so, as is usual, I suppose you drift towards medicine if you've got medically qualified parents and, that, and that's what I did I, I didn't really know what I was going to do but because I just about got the grades to get into medicine I, I went in for it and uh, I really haven't looked back and I just find that I really enjoyed it and I went um, into general medicine and then moved to neurology because I find it fascinating at that time neurology was a very clinical subject it was a hands-on subject we didn't have CT scans and MRI scans it was a purely clinical specialty. And from there, I then went on to subspecialize in epilepsy because once again, it was a very um, interesting, I thought, subject, but one which was totally neglected. And even neurologists tended not to spend much time looking at people with epilepsy when there was clearly an awful lot to be done. Yeah, we're talking about kind of the, the, the early 1980s here. Is it 1980 that you, you qualify as a, as a doctor? I prefer not to talk about that. Then. That's fine. <laughs> if, if, if that's what... <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those subjects we'll stay well away from. That's fine. I qualified in 1984. Maybe tell me, um, is epilepsy something that's on your radar before you go to study medicine as part of your life at all? No, it really wasn't. It was really something that I evolved into through general medicine and then into neurology. And then seeing that epilepsy actually is one of the most common neurological illnesses. But in fact, one which was often ignored by neurologists at that time, there were very few epilepsy specialists. And clearly it was something that deserved attention. And I, and I was stimulated by the fact that I went to Cardiff to work with Professor Alan Richens, and we got very much involved in the development of the new anti-epileptic drugs. And that really was a, a kickstart for, for my interest there and, and, and specialised epilepsy clinics, which again, didn't exist. And, and again, so, so what is it that leads you into uh, neurology and epilepsy in particular then, you know, once you've qualified, what, what, what brings you down that path? Is there anything in particular? Well, a lot of neurological diseases you can't cure, but you can treat, but also, they tend to be chronic and long term. So you really get to know your patients. You live with your patients for many, many years. And I, I find that very satisfying. And I felt if I can do something for this person, I'm and I have to do something for this person because I'm going to see them for years and years and years to come. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the friendship between myself and my patients, if, if you like to call it that. Tell me maybe a little bit about the development of epilepsy drugs th throughout your life, because if you said yourself from, from the time you, you qualify as a doctor until the point at which you retire, it, it, it's a, an entire quantum shift in the types of treatments that are available. Essentially, when I started, we had three, there were maybe four drugs you could treat epilepsy with. Epilepsy with phenobarbital, which had been around since the Second World, First World War, but was rarely used because it was so sedative. Then there was phenytoin, which uh, certainly worked, but had lots of side effects. So the two main drugs that we used were epilim and tegretol. 
uh, carbamazepine or sodium valproate. And, and there was little else. So you put people on one or t'other, sometimes guided by what type of epilepsy they had. But then just at the time that I was going through my specialist training, along came all of these other drugs, other drugs which worked in different types of epilepsy, broad spectrum or narrow spectrum, but also had less side effects, it seemed, than the other drugs and were much better tolerated. And so it was a whole quantum shift, as you say, in the treatment of the disease. We could treat people better, we could get more people seizure free, and more importantly as well, we could have them side effect free. The, I'm going to skip forward just a little here. The, the UK and Ireland Epilepsy and Pregnancy Register maybe talk a little bit about your role in it and about its role then in exposing the effects of sodium valparate in, in pregnancy. Well, it follows on very much from what I've just said in that we had this quantum shift. All of a sudden, we had all these new drugs to treat patients with, and these drugs were increasingly popular. So I said to myself, well, these drugs are going to be taken by people long term over many years. Half the people we will treat will be women, most of whom will be young women. So I asked the drug companies very simply, um, do you know if these drugs are safe if, if the women have, get pregnant? And the drug companies came back and went, oh, yeah, of course they are. We, we test them on rats, you know. And I, I went, hmm, OK, there must be a better method than that. Well, you can't do clinical trials on women who are going to get pregnant. It's just not ethical. So we came up with the idea of a very simple idea. Vis-a-vis, -vis, we would ask GPs, neurologists, and the women themselves through websites and, 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 and going to conferences and so on. Well, if you're a woman or you're a woman who has epilepsy and are on a drug or even not on a drug, just let us know. And we'll take some details your name, your age, et cetera, contact details of what drug you were on and the dose of it. And then we put that away. And then having noted they've told us what their expected day of delivery is, we would contact them three months after delivery and, and just simply ask, how do things go? Is all well? Any difficulties in, in the delivery, in the pregnancy, or indeed with the child? And then later on, we actually extended that to follow kids up for many years because it became apparent there were, there were other issues apart from the obvious ones at birth, like spina bifida and cleft palate. And I mean, it, it, we, we were really looking at the new drugs because that was the, the question. But obviously, we had lots of people on sodium valproate, epilim, or carbamazepine, tegretol, because those were the two main, mainstay drugs. And what came out, I mean, we've got 12,000 women in this study, so it's a, a very big, big study. But what came out very, very clearly was that the new drugs actually looked quite safe. But epilim, sodium valproate, was called. I'm not sure whether we've lost you there or whether I've lost you at my end here. Technology is a wonderful thing. This drug's been around since 1976, but nobody had really noticed it. Um, tell me then a little bit about when those results started to come in and when you yourself and obviously the, the, the people you're working with and everybody else around you start to realize that there is there's a very serious problem here and perhaps one that you wouldn't necessarily have anticipated when you started the study. Well, we, well, we certainly didn't anticipate it. We had an idea that sometimes um, epilim could be associated with spina bifida. There was a sort of Bit, bit, bit out there, but nobody had any idea of the extent of the problem. And it didn't know the extent of the problem because each neurologist might have one or two women who got pregnant during his career, and you're not likely to come across it. And you don't follow the kids up, so you don't know if they've got learning difficulties. So it was really out there, but not known about, not recognized. And this drug has damaged thousands of times more kids than the other might ever did. To the mind, it was obvious these kids had a really unusual abnormality, but the valproate kids had something that can occur naturally. And if you only see one or two in a career, you're not, you're not going to decide there's a definite problem. And as I say, you're not going to follow the kids up and see the, the future problems that they have. So we, 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 once we this started coming through, we, 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 we talked about it every conference we went to. It, 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 it hit headlines in certain places. And as you say, I, it was a panorama special about it at one stage. Not everybody knows about it. Everybody thinks, oh, of course, that we don't use that drug in pregnancy. But as I say, it's been around since 1976. And it was still very widely used 
up until well into the 2000s. I'm going to jump slightly further forward here. I'm going to ask you maybe about yourself, because obviously you reach a point in your life where you're, you're getting maybe a little closer to, to retirement. And then you end up in a situation where you become the patient instead of being the doctor. Yeah, very unusual. It's nice to see things from both sides, I suppose, or maybe not. Um, you say coming up to retirement, um, I always, my, my father was a dentist and he, in his latter days, bought a farm because he came from farming stock. And this was going to be his life when he retired. And he, and he was really looking forward uh, to retirement and, and doing this. And he retired and within a month he was dead. And you hear that so, so often. Now, I love my job. I, I always said I would try and retire early um, because of my uh, father's experience. I never would have. I love my job. My wife would say, you, I didn't, you'd never have got me out of it. You had to drag me out kicking and screaming. Um, so in many ways, I suppose my illness was probably the best thing that happened to me um, because it, it forced me to retire. Do you want to hear about the, the illness? Yeah, and I'm kind of interested in, 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 in the sequence as to, as to how that occurs, what happens then, how you, you find out yourself and, and, and maybe your, your reaction to it at the time, realising what's happened. Uh, yeah, it, it was very interesting, I suppose, um, in that I was the last person to know about it. <laughs> I developed an unusual type of encephalitis. Um, encephalitis is usually inflammation of the brain caused by a virus. But mine was an autoimmune encephalitis, i.e. I was attacking my own brain. And it's a condition which has become increasingly recognized but only over the last few years. Um, I actually wrote myself up as a case history in the British Medical Journal. <laughs> I, I like this uh, uh, condition. But basically, I, I was the last person to know about it. What was happening was I became intermittently confused. Um, and I sort of recognized that because we went to a concert one night with my wife. I went to the, the toilet and I couldn't find my way back. Um, and she had to send people to try and, try and find me. And I couldn't understand what, why that had happened. But in retrospect, it's clear it happened because I was having minor seizures. And I didn't pick that up as an epileptologist. And worse still, the specialist team that I had trained in the Royal Epilepsy Specialist Nurses, other neurologists didn't pick it up either. That I was having these little episodes and I was having them when I was driving, you know, still here, and when I was doing clinics and so on. Um, but my wife realized what they were. She's a, she trained as an epilepsy volunteer and she shot me uh, to, my, to my colleagues. And they eventually persuaded me to have an EEG. As you know, that's an electrical recording of the brain. And during the EEG, I switched off, I turned my head, lip smack, which is very characteristic of a minor seizure. And there it was in the EEG. So I was uh, subsequently admitted to the hospital for further tests. And they put me in, in the neurosurgical ward um, because they didn't want me waking up beside one of my own patients, uh, which might be a bit scary for them. Um, and we carried further tests and we found out that I had this rather unusual form of um, encephalitis. So they hit me with everything. It was my, I was a senior neurologist at that time, so my junior colleagues had to look after me, which was a bit scary for them. But they hit me with absolutely everything. And, and, I, and I've done very well, but it has left me with certain problems. I have epilepsy, although I've been seizure-free now for quite some considerable time, but I continue on medication. The major problem uh, that caused me to retire was I, I have memory of issues. It affected my temporal lobes, particularly my right temporal lobe, and caused scarring there. So the particular difficulty I have is with locations. Um, when I get in the car, I put the GPS on. Um, because I, I, I could get lost very easily. But I can compensate for that. But I retired because I knew I, I, I had the insight, at least, to, to recognize that I had a problem with my memory. And you know, I had a good reputation. I think I had a good reputation in medicine. And I did not want to go back to work, make a wrong decision, injure somebody, and just ruin, ruin, what, and ruin somebody else's life. So I, when they offered me early retirement, I, I took it. In terms of just let, let me go back a little bit, that diagnosis and when it happens, and as you said, you, you were being treated by you, your own team. There's, there's obviously two things going on there. As you said yourself, they don't want to do anything that's going to mess up in front of you. But for, for you, did you think that you were in the best possible hands because you knew these people and that you knew that you, you would rather be nowhere else? Or, or was that quite strange for you to be to, to become the patient? 
No, I, I was I was very happy. I, I knew I suppose some of my colleagues wouldn't take me on. They were just you know they, they couldn't do it. Um, and I was actually one of the most junior consultants that actually took me on. But I have to say he did a brilliant job. I had never had any concerns whatsoever. And they sent me over to London for a second opinion during the time that I was ill. But I I, I, I had no concerns. I, I, it was explained to me what it was. I, I had the insight to take it in. I, I recognised now what was wrong and the treatments, you know, were, were absolutely what I would have done. So I, I had no concerns. To be honest, in Belfast, you haven't got much of a choice. There's one neurological team in Northern Ireland. So unless I went somewhere else, I wasn't going to get treatment. So... Everybody who, who gets a diagnosis, regardless of whatever point it is in their lives, for me it was when I was 16, and for you it, it, it comes at a different point. Everybody reacts differently emotionally in terms of not necessarily maybe immediately at the moment, but then in, in the months that follow, you, you kind of have to then accommodate it as part of your life. What was that like for you? As I, as I said, I loved my job, and that was the hardest, at, uh, giving, giving it up. Oh, but also, as you know yourself, epilepsy carries with it many disadvantages. You can't drive. And I couldn't drive, obviously, for at least a year. Um, and I did um, get very down and depressed. Now, I attributed that to one of the, the drugs that I was on. And I think it was probably more of that because I'm actually quite a resilient person. And um, I think the person that's found it hardest um, to have me retired as my wife. She married me for better, she married me for worse, but she didn't marry me for lunch. So um, I think she struggled more than, than I have. I, I kind of said, look, th this is it. You, you can dwell on this for the rest of your life or you can just get on with things. And I just tend to get on with things. We switched the drug and I've been fine since. Yeah, maybe tell me a little bit about that because you know at, at conferences like this, if this was the, the real world and everybody was in the same room, there would be conversations being had about about people's treatments and about what worked for you at the time and about how much um, change and how much tinkering there was initially with with your treatment before you managed to find something that worked for you. What was that like? Uh, for, well, for me, it, it wasn't too bad. Um, they kind of loaded me up with uh, anti seizure drugs. Um, and then whittled it down to one. And the one they whittled it down to was Levertrecetam, Kepra, which was a drug that we were using uh, a lot of. But there's been a lot of discussion just actually in recent years about mood effects associated with it. I think there's a, a, um, a section on it in one of the forthcoming neuro Irish neurological conferences. Um, and I certainly got very depressed on it. Otherwise, I was fine. Um, and we were, I was switched down to Lamotrigine. Um, and I, I've been absolutely fine since. I have been seizure free, which is, you know, I'm very fortunate in that respect, given that I have scarring of my temporal lobe, so I'm, I'm a bit cautious. And although I'm being seizure free now for a while, I won't stop the monitoring. Um, two reasons. One is obviously I, I have to give up my driving license for a period of time to make sure it was okay. But more, much more importantly, I have a scar, my temporal lobe, I'm at risk of having further seizures. Why risk? Why take your safety in other way at this point? I'm taking one tablet a day, 200 milligrams. I think I will just stick with it. Do you have uh, what people would traditionally call triggers? I, I know that I don't, and none of the traditional triggers seem to work for me. You know, it, it, again, I'm, I'm been seizure free for, I think, 11 years now at this point. Yeah. But but it could happen at, at any point to me. Do, do you have those? Uh, not, no, not, not really. I think at the time that I had the seizures, being tired and stressed, I mean, there was a lot going on at, at, at work at the, at the time that I got it, and I, I, I was very uh, emotionally and physically run down, and, and the seizures could have been triggered by that. But no, subs I, I haven't really noticed anything other than that, and I, obviously, you know, I do get tired now, and uh, living with a wife is stressful, obviously. So again, I haven't had any seizures. So I, I, I don't think I have triggers at the present time. No. In, in terms of support, I mean, maybe emotional and 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 in in other ways, it's always one of those those questions that we ask, uh, you know, people to be mindful of as well, because that it's it's something that affects everybody around you. In, in terms of who did you turn to at the at the time that maybe you know helped you in a, in a non medical sense? Well, my wife was my wife was very supportive. Um, 
she's not here at the moment, so I can I can I can say this. I wouldn't like to say it for her, but she was very very supportive during all this because it was a very traumatic time, and kids are grown up. One of them lives in Scotland, and another lives a bit far away. So they you know they had to be brought into the picture as well, and they were obviously clearly very upset to see their father sitting up in a neurosurgical bed, and, and at times not even you know recognizing who they were properly. So uh, yeah, I would just family and friends they've been, they've been generally very very good do you think if you had ended up not retiring that being a patient would have made you a different doctor had you gone back um i don't know the answer to that to, to, to be honest with you um i always thought i had empathy with patients and as i say my patients as promotional just become long-term friends you, 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 you knew them over long periods. And I'd like to think I had empathy and understood their problems even before I got them. Um, so I, I don't know if I can answer that question. As I say, because I had the, the memory issues, I really haven't got the option to utilize the skills that I have. It, it's interesting actually, because when I got ill, it was clear that I'd been ill for some weeks or probably months before I presented. And my colleagues had to review all my notes in case I had made a mistake. And they reassured me there was not one single mistake. And in fact, now I mean, I talk to my friends and my colleagues and all that. And my neurology memory is still A1. It's just these specific things about locations and so on that I have problems with. So yes, maybe I could have fought to go back to work. Maybe I would have been a different person. Maybe I would have been a, a different doctor and care, but I don't know. Maybe I'm going to ask you something about something else we're talking about. Actually, tomorrow uh, here at the conference, um, we're meeting four neurologists and they're going to talk about medicinal cannabis and about its role in the treatment of epilepsy. What's your take on, on all of that? Okay, well, well, I've been out of it for a wee while, as you, as you know. Um, cannabis in neurology generally it has a place. It certainly works very well for spasticity in patients with multiple sclerosis, for example. The use in epilepsy is a little bit more controversial because it's always been held up as epileptogenic, i.e. it can actually bring on seizures. However, I always thought, and again, this will probably come out in the comments more, that it did that because people's supply of cannabis wasn't secure because often they were getting it illegally rather than being able to get the bibalone tablets. And if it's insecure, what happens is you take it, but then you run out, so it's a different strength. And then it's a change, most likely the stopping of the drug that triggers a seizure rather than the drug itself. Also, as I said to you, stress and so on was a, was, a, was a potential trigger for my epilepsy. It certainly is for many other people, and cannabis can help to reduce that by, by being a relaxant. So I would be interested in that conversation, but um, there are pros and cons to me. Um, can I ask you then about your retirement and about it, uh, whether or not it's true that your wife was the one who insisted that you find something to do? Um, she, she insists I find everything to do to, 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 to get out of the house and under her feet, absolutely. And th that led you then to, to, to writing, but that was something that, that you'd, you'd always been interested in. Um, uh, well, it, it's a tricky one. I, I kind of overcome that. Although I had an, an honours degree in medicine, I had two doctorates, and I had been a consultant neurologist. My so-called friends always knew that I had a chink in my armour vis-a-vis I failed my English language GCSE. And they never let me forget it. So anything smart or erudite that I was to say, they would just turn around and go, can you spell that docker? <laughs> so my nickname is the docker. Um, and I can't, so I kind of overcompensated for this even before I retired. And I actually did an English literature degree through the Open University, which I find absolutely fascinating. And you meet some most interesting people uh, through the Open University. Um, but having got a, a, a BA on in, in English literature, that stimulated me to, to utilize that, and particularly when I had nothing else to do. So yeah, they took up writing. I, I've written many medical papers. I've written a couple of medical neurological handbooks, but I've never written any kind of fiction. Not everybody makes that transition, even when they've gone to, to, to study it at, at any point in their life. What, what was the thing that nudged you into making that jump? Or was there a thing that made you go, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try this? 
Um, the first novel I wrote, it, it's actually, um, it was, was a wee while ago. I think I even wrote it when I was still working. Certainly it's out of print and you can, you, you can get it for about 10p off Amazon second hand. But it, it, what stimulated me there was, there was I had four, three very good friends and one died very suddenly and tragically. And we used to go out and play golf together as, 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 as us old boys do. And we always had this great idea of a special sponsored golf tournament. And it was 32 holes of golf in one day. And you say, well, why 32? Well, it was one hole of golf in every county in Ireland, taking a professional golfer and a golfer from each club um, by helicopter around, around Ireland to raise money um, for a charity. And so the book is based around that. It's about one of their wives develops multiple sclerosis and can't get the drug beat interferon, which was only relatively new at that time, had to be bought. It cost £10,000 a year. So this was a, this book was written around um, a, a tournament in which people try to raise the money by, by, by playing this whole of golf in every, in, in every uh, uh, county. And then the IRA get involved and they try and steal the money. So, so that, got me, that got, got me started. Now, now, my, now my novels are much better. T tell me about your more recent work then, and tell me about bringing your medical experience into your work then, writing fiction. Yeah, I, because I, you, you write about what you know about, but the, 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 the books tend to be sort of murder mysteries. Actually, I don't know much about murder mysteries, but no, I mean, apart from what I've read, but, but I try and incorporate um, some aspect of neurology or medicine into them. Um, in a, in one of them, trick or treat, um, you probably know you can buy um, medicines or drugs over the internet. Do you know what the most common drug you buy over the internet is? I have read this in an article actually, and it's Viagra, isn't it? It is. It is yeah. Viagra. What you, but people who buy it don't realise is it. What often they get is not real Viagra; it's counterfeit. And some of these counterfeit drugs, a don't work, but b can have nasty side effects. So trick or treat really is a, is a, is about that aspect vis-a-vis -vis a company brings out an alternative to, to Viagra and they're very hopeful for it, but then all of a sudden people start to have strokes, heart attacks and, and die taking it. And then they realize it's actually not their drug, it's a, it's a counterfeit drug. But one of the people that helps to solve the problem is a little 16 year old guy who's a bit of a nerd and he's very isolated because he's got epilepsy, but he spends a lot of time on the computer and he hacks into the, the computer site and so on and, and, and helps to break the, 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 the cycle of the criminality. And you've got a new book coming out as well, is that right? I have. Um, uh, there's another one called The Fly in the Tree. Do you know what a fly in the tree have in common? That one I don't. They're, they're both living organisms, they're both alive. Okay. So the fly of the tree is about something that isn't alive. Um, it's began to bring in neurochemistry because this person is analyzing um, neurochemicals and finds a very unusual result in one of uh, the post-mortem samples. And this person didn't feel didn't die in the way that she's, she's supposed to have died. And that's where the, no the novel kicks off. But the most recent one is called Wasted Talent. And I'm trying to develop a character, a policeman, something like Rebus or something like that. If only, <laughs> but Peaceman is obviously a very good detective, but he has a flaw and his flaw is that he's developing a neurological illness. So it's coming out, I think, at the beginning of November. Available on Amazon or all good bookshops. <laughs> uh, maybe just before we finish as well, it, it would be strange not to ask you about the last maybe year and a half as well, because obviously it has been a time in medicine and for those people that you know who have, have worked in it, that's been completely unlike any other. Well, what has the last 18 months of COVID been like for, for you as somebody who spent a life working in medicine? Yeah, I, I, seeing the hospitals, it actually, I suppose, makes me glad that I have retired. I, I've, I've been vaccinating, I volunteered to be vaccinating again. It was nice to get back in, into it, it, albeit in a different and, and essentially easier role. Um, I, I find it quite interesting because when I, the last ones I did, people were sort of my age or whatever, and come in and they go, Doctor, you know, I'm not sure about this vaccine and I don't like needles and have you done it? <laughs> and they, they go, we're getting down to the younger ones now, the 16, the 18 year olds, and they come in and go, oh, doc, no problem, no problem. And you bring the needle out and they faint. <laughs> so it, it, for me, I mean, I'm being, being facetious about it, but I mean, I think 
the vaccination program is working and we're going to get there eventually, but it's an awful time if you want to go abroad. It, everybody's life has changed. And uh, the hospitals, I mean, I, I feel sorry for my colleagues working under that kind of pressure. They can't get to see the people they really would have seen in the past. The waiting lists are, are growing because we're all consumed with this pandemic. Perhaps um, just before we finish up, I want to remind people that tomorrow morning I'm going to be chairing a roundtable discussion on medical cannabis and epilepsy. That's between 10 and midday. Uh, tomorrow it features Professor Norman Delante, and Professor Colin Doherty, and Dr. Blanca McCoy, and Dr. Brian Lynch as well. If you're looking for the details of that, you'll find it on the Epilepsy Ireland website at epilepsy.ie. But uh, for now, Dr. Jim Morrow, it has been absolutely lovely talking to you, and thanks a million for taking the time. Thank you.